Welcome and thanks for listening to the Way Bible Church podcast. Here at The Way, we're all about life change. And we pray that as you listen to these hope-filled messages, that you would be transformed by the love of Jesus. To find out more about us and our service times, location, events, and more, visit TWBCSS.com today. So when you found Matthew chapter number 26, the title of this morning's message is called Countdown to the Cross. We're going to take an extensive look at the last seven days of Jesus' life and what Jesus did in those last seven days. And it's good to know that Jesus even believed in what we are talking about this year in the term community in the word transparency. How many of you know where Jesus was did not define who he was? Amen. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, it did not define who he was as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Can I get an amen on that? And so when we really talk about community at the Way Bible Church, we know this, accountability plus transparency equals community. And accountability simply means this, you can count on me. How many of you know you are glad you can count on Jesus Christ, amen? You can count on him. He is accountable. He is there for you. And just like we are going to be there for you as a church and as individuals, but also we believe it's accountability plus transparency, that where you are doesn't define who you are. I'm so glad that my adversities don't define my anointing. Come on, somebody. (laughs) How many of y'all have ever had adverse days? Come on. (laughs) Things just weren't going your way. You wake up and this would have been a great day to go right back to bed. Come on, somebody. You've had the adversity in your life, right? Your adversity doesn't define the anointing. And so Jesus was very transparent and community is this. It's caring and being cared for where you are so we can help you get to where you need to be. And as we read the gospel of Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse number 47, the Bible says this. It says, while he was still speaking... Judas came, which was one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs, and the chief priest and the elders of the people. And now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend. How many of you are glad that you didn't have to be Jesus in that moment? (laughs) That the one who betrayed you for crucifixion, you're still calling friend. And as Pastor Derek and I were talking, he said the actual translation of that literally means my good friend. My good friend. He said, my good friend, do what you came to do. And then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servants, uh, the servant of the high priest's ear and cut it off. And Jesus said to him, put back your sword into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you not think that I can appeal to my father? Come on. And at once he will send me more than 12 legions of angels. Listen, that means a, a legion is a, it consists of 6,000. And he said he will send me 12 of them at least. At least God, Jesus is saying God can send over 72,000 angels right now if I want him to. Come on. But still, he says, but how then, if I did that, should the scriptures be fulfilled? That it must be so. At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me day after day? I sat in the temples uh, teaching you and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. The first thing we have to understand before we start discussing the last week of Jesus's life is about the Jewish or the Hebrew calendar. The Hebrew calendar is different from the uh, calendar that we live by. We live by the Gregorian calendar, and our day starts at midnight and ends at midnight, 11.59 and 59 seconds the following day, correct? And so their calendar, the Hebrew calendar, is a little bit different than ours. The Hebrew calendar, uh, the, the beginning of one day is the evening of the previous day for us. So tonight when the sun begins to set and the third star appears, it's going to be the transition to the next day. So as the sun begins to set tonight and the the Hebrews go by three stars, meaning everything will be confirmed by at least two or three witnesses. So when the third star appears in the sky, they know the beginning of the next day has started. So where we begin, I think our day begins when we wake up. 
their day actually begins the evening the night before and goes into the next day because they go by the creation calendar beginning in Genesis chapter 1 verse 5 and it says God called the light day and the darkness night so there was evening and morning on the first day I like to say God starts with the evening and then goes to morning because God always starts from a place of rest And so there was evening and morning on the first day. And so as we're going on this seven-day journey from Friday to Friday during the final week of Jesus, we're going to stop at 9 a.m. the Friday morning that he is crucified. And so this message is the precursor to next week's message, At What Cost, is the title of next week's message. And so as I begin to think about Jesus, he knew he only had one week to live. That's just 168 hours. And he did more in 168 hours than a lot of people people think. Most people read the accounts of John and, and Matthew and Mark and Luke and think this was all throughout his ministry. But listen to all the things that he did the last week of his life. Let's go back to Friday, seven days before the Passover. Jesus begins his journey to Jericho with 168 hours left to live. As Jesus goes through Jericho on his way, while he's entering into Jericho, he heals a blind man named Bartimaeus. Now, the name Bartimaeus means bar, means son of, Timaeus. So whenever you see bar, son of, it means son of, Timaeus is the name. So when he heals Timaeus, he's going in there. But as he's walking down the road going into Jericho, Bartimaeus is sitting on the side of the road crying out to Jesus. And he's calling Jesus by a very specific name he's saying Jesus son of David that's crucial for Jesus entering the last week of his life Bartimaeus a blind man who's never seen Jesus before is crying out Jesus son of David when he begins to declare son of David he is recognizing a couple things about Jesus the first thing is he's recognizing that Jesus is the Messiah who's coming to the world When he says son of David, he knew that the Messiah would come from the lineage of David. So he's declaring that Jesus is the Messiah. He's also declaring Jesus, when he said Jesus, son of David, that Jesus is a king out of the lineage of King David. He's also declaring he is the man that God sent by faith from Abraham. Because the Bible said, in Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And so Bartimaeus, by simply crying out Jesus, son of David, is making a uh, a declaration about the lineage of faith and who Jesus is, a son of God. He's making a declaration about that Jesus is the Messiah. He's also making a declaration that Jesus is the king who had come. Come on. And all of that, he's a blind man sitting on the side of the road. And everybody's telling him to be quiet. How many of you know we live in a culture telling Christians to be quiet? We don't want to hear about that Jesus. But I'm here to declare that it is Jesus, son of David. He is the king. He is the Messiah. And I'm not going to be silent as much as the world wants to silence us. Come on. But Bartimaeus did something else. When he would not be quiet, Jesus began to say, let him come. And when they said, get up, he's calling you. Bartimaeus, the Bible is specific about this, says it's threw off his cloak. Listen, the cloak is what defined him. It would have been a beggar's cloak. It would have been the only thing that would keep him warm. It would have been the only thing that would bring him comfort. It would have been the only thing that would provide him shelter from the wind and the elements that were around him. And he said, I'm throwing off everything that I have and everything that defines me to go after the one who can change me. Come on. My question is today, will you throw off the things that so easily hold you back from Jesus and make your way to Jesus this morning and find out what Jesus has in store for you? As Jesus is continuing to walk into Jericho, many of us remember this story, he goes to the house of Zacchaeus. And so on his way to Jericho, he heals blind Bartimaeus. And just to prove that he is not just a God of physical healing, but he wants to do a total transformation, he encounters a man named Zacchaeus. And I'm going to give a shameless plug for community life. This week, Tuesday, we're starting a brand new community life group called Healing Through the Bible. If you want to be a part of that, just go to twbcss.com, click on community life, and register for that group. It kicks off this Tuesday. And so, but Jesus, believing in total transformation, didn't just want to heal a blind man. He walks up to one of the people that would have been considered some of the worst sinners of their time because Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was an extorter. He was a robber. He would have been known as a thief. He would have been avoided. He would have been rejected. He would have been somebody that nobody would have wanted to go to their house because everybody hated him. Jesus walks into Jericho, looks up in a tree as a man had climbed up a tree seeking him, and he says, Zacchaeus... Now, I don't know if he knew it was Zacchaeus by reputation or word of knowledge, 
but somehow he knew his name. And he was very specific, just like when he called for Bartimaeus. He said, Zacchaeus, come down, for I must go to your house today. And to know that Jesus is still in the saving business, not just Zacchaeus came to believe in Christ and follow him, but his whole family came to Christ and began to follow after Jesus. This all happened on the Friday before Passover. I'm amazed at Jesus. 168 hours before he's about to die, Joel would have had a little bit different agenda than healing a blind man and transforming a sinner into a, into a saved person. Joel would have been on a beach in, Fahit, in Tahiti or Fiji. <laughs> I'm just saying. But Jesus, on his way to save everyone, was intentional to stop for the ones that needed him along the way. This all happened as, on the Friday before Passover. On this journey, as Jesus is walking into Jericho, he's having a conversation with his disciples. And this is the first time that Jesus clearly tells them, with no questions asked, he said, I've come to Jerusalem because I'm going to be crucified. He delivers the news to his 12 disciples seven days before it's about to happen. It's Saturday now, and we're 144 hours away from the crucifixion, six days before the Passover. Jesus arrives in a small town called Bethany. Bethany is an amazing town throughout the scriptures. It's where uh, three prominent people in Jesus' life lived. It's where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived in this small town of Bethany. And just so you know that Jesus uh, believes in total transformation, I'm reminded of Martha in Luke chapter number 10 when Jesus was at their house at a prior time. And in Luke chapter number 10, the Bible says Martha was anxious and she was frustrated because Martha was busy serving and her sister Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. But listen, in, in Luke chapter 10, she's anxious and she's frustrated. But now in the t- uh, account in John chapter 12, the Bible says she's serving joyfully. Come on. God can do so much in your life. You could be anxious and frustrated when you walk in. But if you'll come to the presence of Jesus yeah. before you leave here, you can leave serving him joyfully. You can leave him with a heart of joy to go serve him. Mary was sitting at his feet in Luke chapter 10. But now the Bible says Mary is doing the ministering because Mary's the one who broke the alabaster jar and began to anoint Jesus for his burial. Mary, who was sitting in the previous session, is now doing the ministering in the next session. Listen, God believes in total transformation. Lazarus, whom Jesus wept over and who Jesus raised from the dead, the Bible says in, in the Gospel of John chapter 12, is now reclining and rejoicing with Jesus. You can go from a dead person to reclining and rejoicing with Jesus. The deeper picture of that is Lazarus is a picture, could be a picture of dead religion. And when Jesus calls your name to come forth, he doesn't just want you to do work for him. He wants to recline and rejoice with you. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ that he's trying to develop. And as they're there and and Mary is now serving joyfully, or I'm sorry, Martha is now serving joyfully and Mary is now doing ministry and uh, uh, Lazarus is reclining and rejoicing, crowds began to gather around the house to see Jesus once again. Sunday, which would be considered today Palm Sunday, five days before the Passover, the Bible says this, that there was a triumphal entry where Jesus leaves Bethany and goes into Jerusalem to get ready for the Passover. The Bible says some Greeks even became followers of Jesus and followed him. uh, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. He visits the temple, and then he returns to Bethany. The thing about this triumphal entry, it's pretty amazing that Jesus said, I'm going to sit on the colt of a donkey. Because in the Old Testament, only the judges rode on the colts of donkeys. Jesus, when he sat on the donkey, was saying, I'm not just the king who's come for you, but I'm also the true judge, as he rode into Jerusalem. And he knew that instead of judging Jerusalem, he would die for Jerusalem. Instead of taking his rightful place as the judge, he took his rightful place as the sacrifice. And as he's riding into uh, Jerusalem on this donkey, The Bible says this, it gives us the picture of people laying their cloaks on the ground so the donkey will walk on cloaks or palm branches on the ground. And all the people were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, blessed be the son of David. They're declaring that. But listen to this. When Jesus was who they wanted him to be, which was king, 
they gave him palms which represented praise. When Jesus was being who they needed him to be, which is a savior, they gave him thorns. When Jesus was being who they wanted him to be, they gave him praise. But when he was being who they needed him to be, they gave him thorns. The same people who cried Hosanna on Sunday cried crucify on Friday. This is why when you hear from God, you don't need to go by the approval of people. The same crowds that are cheering you on to take the step of faith will be crucifying you five days later. Come on. The same people who will say, go, you need to follow after the will of God. The minute you begin to do it, we'll start telling you how you miss God. Come on, I'm telling you this from personal experience. When you hear from God, you do not need the approval of people. And too many times we're looking for the approval of government We're looking to the approval of culture. We're looking to the approval of things that don't matter. When the only approval we need is the green light from God to take a step of faith and keep going forward. I want to ask you a personal question because we look at people back at this time and we say, how could they be saying Hosanna on this day but crucify him on that day? Well, let's put it in perspective here. How many of you know when Jesus is being who we want him to be? giving us raises, giving us promotions, making the marriage better. The kids aren't acting up. Come on, somebody. The kids aren't acting up. Come on. It's been a good week at the house. We give him our, on Sunday morning, our palms of praise. We hold our hands up and we worship him and we give him praise. But my question to you is, when he's being who we want him to be, we give him palms of praise. But the question is, what about when he's being who we need him to be? What about when he's being who we need him to be? When he's being who we need him to be, what about when he's working out adverse situations in our life? What about when he's working out the troubled spots in our life? How many of you know God still has some work to do on Joel? (laughs) And when he's doing work on me, it's not always palms of praise. (laughs) It feels like thorns of pain. But do we praise him the same way when we feel the conviction of our sin as we do when we receive the forgiveness of that sin? He's still the same Jesus. So when when Jesus is being who we want him to be, we give him praise. But when he's being who we need him to be and working out adverse situations in our life and working out the struggles of our life and working out the problems that we're going through. How many of you know he didn't always put out the fire, but when he didn't put out the fire for Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, he showed up in the fire. Just because he doesn't put the fire out doesn't mean he's not going to show up in. And there's a beautiful thing about Holy Spirit fire. It refines you, but Jesus is not making you walk through the refining process alone. Come on, somebody. He's there for you. But we must praise him the same, whether it's times of prominence or times of, I'm going to call it promotion and change in our life. Listen, Jesus wants the throne of your heart, but he knew to get there, he would have to go through the thorn of your sin. Jesus wants this place in your heart. He wants the throne of your heart, but he knew to get there, he would have to deal with Joel's sin in the process and he still went and died for me anyway monday 96 hours four days before the passover jesus returns to jerusalem he cleanses the temple and listen this is the second time he cleansed the temple jesus cleansed the temple twice he cleansed it he cleansed it at his first passover in john 2 and then he cleansed it at his third passover in matthew chapter 21 today i believe jesus wants to do the same thing in our temple as he did in that temple I believe he wants to turn over some tables in our life because here's what the tables represented. They represented bondage that was holding the people back from coming into the presence. How do I know that? Because the Bible says he flipped over the tables of the money changers. The money changers were people who were supposed to be there so when people came from a long distance, they could give them money to purchase a pigeon or a, or a lamb or whatever they were needing for the sacrifice. 
But instead of just charging them fair price, they were charging them two and three times the amount and extorting people so they could not come to the presence. The tables represented the bondage that was holding people back from coming into the presence. And Jesus knew it and saw it. So he went and flipped over the things that represented the bondage. Come on. And I believe in my life and in your life, Jesus wants to come in and turn over some tables so that the thing that is keeping you in bondage and is holding you back from coming into the presence, he begins to release you from it and says, the price has already been paid in full. You're set free. On this same day, he also, as he's leaving, he curses the fig tree. And everybody asked me, Pastor Joel, why did he curse the fig tree? I've heard of a lot of different sermons and a lot of different illustrations on why he would have cursed it. Such as figs in this day, if they had leaves without figs, it just wasn't supposed to happen. So he saw the tree that had leaves, but it had no figs, so he cursed it. Meaning that there are trees that actually look like they should be, but aren't bearing any fruit that they need to be. I haven't settled my theology on why he actually did it. But I'm just telling you, he did it on that day. He cursed the fig tree. He returns to Bethany with his 12 disciples. 72 hours, three days before the Passover. The disciples are walking back and they notice the fig tree had withered that Jesus has cursed. He also teaches in the temple all day that day. 48 hours, Wednesday, two days before the Passover. Jesus continues teaching um, as the Sanhedrin begin to plot to have Jesus killed. Some people call this Silent Wednesday where Jesus spent most of his day alone. Thursday... This would be Thursday morning. Now, remember the, the, the Hebrew calendar. It's Thursday morning when he's walking out. But remember, just a few hours from now, it's about to begin to be Friday for them on the evening. So it's Thursday morning. They make their way to Jerusalem to start the Passover preparations because that evening is when they would do the Passover. Thursday evening at sundown, Jesus meets with his disciples for the Passover meal. Friday had started for them. Now listen to this. The gospel of John is so unique in the recording of the, of the life of Jesus Christ that chapters um, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, all five chapters right there, John 13 through 17, are all about four hours of Jesus being in the upper room with the disciples. From chapter, I believe it is chapter 12, all the way through John chapter 21, all those chapters encompass just the last week of Jesus' life. So John spends almost half of his gospel on the last week of Jesus Christ's life. And it's prominent of what, and it's so important about what he begins to write. So Jesus that evening washes the disciples' feet. He begins to institute the Lord's Supper, which I believe is one of the most sacred things we observe as a Christian. It is we recognize the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What Jesus Christ paid for with his physical body and the cost that you had, uh, put, the, the cost that we have put on him to cover our sins with his blood. And the Bible says this, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Jesus, understanding this, knew what was going to happen as he makes his way to get ready to be crucified. That evening... The final teachings to the disciples were given. The teachings on Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The teaching on the gift of the Holy Spirit that he is to the church. Come on, somebody. How many of you know the Holy Spirit is a gift to the body of Christ? And Jesus tells the disciples at this time, it's better that I go. Because if I go, then I can send the Spirit of God himself. That he will not rest on you, he will dwell in you. And you will be a new creation in Christ Jesus. Come on. And so he gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then he prays the high priestly prayer over the disciples. After that's done that evening, Jesus begins to leave. And they go to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. As they're going to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, as they get to the Garden, they leave eight of the disciples there. Three others, Peter, James, and John, Go with him to a place that I call further still. Then Jesus leaves them through there and then goes even farther into the garden to pray. I say eight disciples because Judas has already departed to go betray Jesus. So eight disciples were there praying. Peter, James, and John went to the place of I call further still. 
It doesn't matter where you are in your Christian walk, there's still a further place to go in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter what you're doing in this life, there's a place that you can press in farther. You can go deeper. You can encounter more of God than you're encountering right now. And God doesn't want to hold back from you. In fact, God wants to pour it all out upon you. Come on. So you can experience the fullness of who he is. And as they go a little farther to pray, Jesus is praying. And the Bible says he began to sweat as of drops of blood. And it is a scientific fact when you are under enough stress and agonizing enough, it is possible to sweat blood. And when Jesus sweat blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, oh, this is so good. First service didn't get this, but I'm going to go on this one. When he sweat drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, he bled in a garden to cover the sin that took place in the garden. When God does total transformation, he redeems all things. Come on. He sweat in the garden to take place of the sin that was in the garden. He said, not my will, but thy will be done three times. It replaces the I wills of Satan. When he said, I will ascend. I will become. Jesus brings about total redemption and transformation. As they're in the garden and as he's going back to his disciples and he finds them all asleep, he awakens them. And just after midnight, just after midnight, Judas comes with his tribe of people that we just read about. And it says, while Jesus was still speaking, Judas came one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. And listen to this. From midnight when they arrested him till 9 a.m., actually about 8.45 the next morning, Jesus went through six different trials and was also beaten and whipped, called a scourging that we'll learn a lot more about next week. Six different trials from midnight till about 8.45. He went to Annas. He went to Caiaphas. He went to the Sanhedrin. He went before Pilate. He went to Herod Antipas. And then he went back and stood before Pilate, who Pilate then issued the whipping or scourging of Jesus. The title of next week's message is, At What Cost? What did Jesus do for us? At what cost? What is your value? At what cost? was the crucifixion. Today, as I've listed several different people, from Bartimaeus, you may be here this morning and you may be the one who has no vision for your life. You can't see. You may be struggling about what what, what you're even going to do the next three weeks of your life. Maybe even you don't even know what tomorrow holds. Listen, nobody knows what tomorrow holds. We may have plans, but we don't know what tomorrow holds. So you need to hold your plans very loosely. (laughs) And understand that God wants to give you vision for your life. He wants to give you vision to how to walk this thing, how to walk this life in Jesus Christ. I also mentioned Zacchaeus. You may be one of the worst of the worst. But listen, Jesus can still save you just like he did anybody else. You are not too far gone. In fact, you may be thinking, I've done some things so bad that if Jesus actually knew all I did. See, here's the thing. Jesus already paid for it before you actually did it. He didn't care how much bad you were going to do because he said, my blood will cover it at all costs. It's been paid in full. Listen, you may be the worst father in the room. You may be the worst mother in the room. And you may have done things that have led your kids to make bad decisions in their life. But I can tell you this, that if God did it then, on a pre-resurrected Jesus Christ, what can he do post-resurrection when all the power of heaven has been unleashed to the church to redeem a family and bring about total transformation in the life of your family? You You may be a Martha in the room. You may be nervous and anxious and frustrated, wishing everybody would just leave and go away. Or you may be the one who's drowning and say, I wish somebody would just help me. Do you not see that I'm drowning? And nobody cares. Jesus already sees it and knows it. And if nobody else in the room sees it, he's already working on your life. And he's telling you this. If you'll just call out the name Jesus, son of David. If you'll just say Jesus, son of David. He's going to come into that anxious moment. 
He's going to come into that depressed moment. He's going to come into that problem moment. He's going to come into that situation that you've held on to that now you know you need to let go and release. You could be Mary. You could be the one who had lived a life that was a mess. But God's calling you into ministry and you know it. God's calling some of you into ministry and you've been running from it. And I'm telling you, your life is going to get messier the longer you run. Stop running. Stop running from the call of God on your life. And I'm not saying that means you're going to plan a church, but that does mean you may need to start a Bible study at your workplace. I'm not saying you got to go across the world to Africa, but it does mean you may need to cross the street and invite your neighbor to church next week. Ministry is not just being on a platform. Ministry is what you do with the day-to-day things in your life and how you're going to let God use you on a day-to-day basis. You could be Lazarus. You could be the one who's excited about your Christian walk. You know how dead you were. And when the resurrection power came in, because Jesus is resurrection and life. Listen, I believe this is, this, this is such a clear picture of the, the, the pre-resurrected Lazarus represents religious and good works. The post-resurrected Lazarus represents relationship and rejoicing with Jesus. Because the post-resurrection Lazarus was reclining with Jesus while Mary began to anoint him and Martha joyfully served him. You can possibly relate to any of those people. But some of you in the room, you could possibly even relate to Judas. And at the end, Jesus was still so gracious to look at Judas, who had already betrayed him, let him get close enough to him to kiss him. And Jesus looked at him in that moment and still said, my good friend, my good friend, I'm telling you this morning, If you're still drawing breath of life in this room, if you're still breathing oxygen in this room, and you've never came to Christ, Jesus is still looking at you saying, my good friend, I'm so glad you came to me. How you respond to him after that is completely different. You can respond like Judas did and go through and go through with the rebellion, or you can change and respond differently. You can lay it all down and say, Jesus, I need you. Even at the very end, Judas looks, or Jesus looks at Judas, and with all the love that I could ever possibly imagine, I believe Jesus smiled and said, My good friend, you've been with me for three years. My good friend, this morning, I don't know who you're relating to, but I know how Jesus is relating to you. He's looking at you today and saying, whatever it is, are you blind and can't see? Is your whole family lost and you need to come to Christ? Are you the hated one, the rejected one? Like Zacchaeus, are you the Martha, the anxious one? Are you the Mary, the messed, up, the messed up one? Are you the Lazarus who was religion and now is the rejoicing and relationship one? Or some of you, you're saying, how can I ever forgive myself? Here's the thing about forgiving yourself. You can't forgive yourself until you first receive the forgiveness from him. Too many people want to try and forgive themselves before they actually receive the forgiveness from him. It's impossible to truly forgive yourself when you haven't received the ultimate forgiveness from him.